Driving around a town doesn't need a large car. In fact, most of the time, you're probably better off with a small one. That's what Smart has been giving you for over 20 years and in electric form since around 2007. Now we have the latest version, which is the Smart EQ 42. Let's see if it can still keep up with the latest electric cars that have been arriving recently. Before we tell you about this tiny little car, if you like this video, please don't forget to comment on it, like it, and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Smart has developed and evolved a lot over its 20 years, but the basic concept has remained. There are larger variants, such as the 4.4, but the classic car has just two seats, enabling it to be much shorter than regular cars. It's only a foot longer than Citroen's minuscule Ami, but the idea is that this isn't a cheap and nasty town car like a G-Wiz. Rather, it's still meant to be luxurious, only in miniature. Smart is part of the Daimler group after all. The latest version is is more rounded than previous versions and actually a bit more convention in appearance than previous models. There are four trims to choose from, starting with the premium, then there's the exclusive Brabus line and the addition Blue Dawn we have here. You can get coupes and cabrios of most trims except this one. The cabrio is £2,400 more than the coupe version. The only real differences between all these trim versions is the styling and design elements, which are too subtle and numerous to go into here. Despite some online controversies, the official specs say that the motor and battery are the same throughout despite the Brabus name. There are lots of paint colour choices ranging in price from £225 to £425. However this sapphire blue matte finish is exclusive to the Blue Dawn. At least they say it's blue, it looks more black to us. We do think this matte finish looks pretty cool, but matte finishes are particularly susceptible to bird poo staining, so parking under a tree is best avoided at all costs. These black Brabus alloys are a special addition for the Blue Dawn car. You've got decently sized disc brakes at the front. At the back it looks like drum brakes. None of these cars have keyless entry, so we have to use this old fashioned thing called a key fob to get inside. Let's have a look. The Smart's interior is not lacking in luxury. This Blue Dawn edition has black leather seats with grey stitching, as does the exclusive, but the premium has black fabric. The Brabus line has black fabric with white stitching. While this is a tiny little car with space for just two occupants, it's actually quite roomy for those two occupants. These seats are pretty comfortable, although you're not going to be driving long distance in this Smart. We don't like the way the seat belt actually cuts into your shoulder. It does have this clip here to alleviate that a little bit, but it doesn't entirely stop it. There's also no clip for the passenger. The seat adjustments are entirely manual and there's no option for electric adjustment. However, they are heated. You do get electric mirror adjustment. Despite the size of this car, there is a decent amount of headroom and that's further accentuated by the fact you've actually got a panoramic sunroof. You can see that there's a blind. That blind, however, is manual and you actually can't open this glass whatsoever. This looks like it should be a Qi charger and in fact, it's just the right size, even for a big phone like this iPhone 12. However, it's not a wireless charger and it doesn't appear to be an option for one either. There's this central armrest, which you can pull back to reveal a 12 volt power adapter. A bit far away if you're gonna stick a sat nav on the screen. Underneath this sliding door, you see a couple of cup holders. In front of the cup holders, you see an auxiliary analog audio input and a couple of USB ports. And Mercedes has kindly supplied this bundle of cables for different types of smartphone. And as we'll see in a second, this is pretty essential in this car. However, once you plug that in, you'll see there's very little space for actually putting cups in the cup holders. The glove compartment shows you why the name glove singular is an appropriate name, because there's pretty much only room for one glove in it. We're not entirely sure what this Velcro band is for, but you do you get a couple of isofix points on the passenger seat, but obviously not the driver's seat unless your baby's doing the driving. One thing we do like about this car is that because it only has two front seats and no rear seats, I don't have to spend any time telling you about the rear seats. However, we are pleased to report that you do actually get a magazine holder for the no rear occupants, so your kids will have somewhere to put their copy of Razzle, or whatever it is kids read these days. There's also an inexplicable rear cup holder for those non-existent rear occupants. At first glance, you might think that this car doesn't even have a boot, but actually it does. A slightly unusual way of opening. You have to open this top bit first and then pull this handle here to get inside. Now this space is actually 260 litres, which is actually more than a Mini Electric, more than a Honda E, and about the same as a BMW i3. There's nothing underneath there, however, there is a space under here where you could maybe put a foldable fishing rod or hunting rifle for when you're going hunting around the city. 
Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky to, um, to demonstrate, but you can actually, believe it or not, take that down, and then you can drop this seat forwards. And I've no idea how much space this is, but it's actually pretty useful. This is all Velcroed in place and we're too lazy to take it out. But if you did, you'd have a space, you could maybe even put a piece of furniture from Ikea in here, which is pretty amazing considering how small this car is. It's actually pretty hard to reach that from the front seats. So this is the part of the video where we normally pop the bonnet and start talking about the battery despite the fact the batteries are almost never in this location. Now, it's a bit unusual in this car because you actually have to pop these two catches here and then this, this thing's actually plastic and it kind of slides out like this. And even the engine isn't underneath here actually. You just get all the fluids and um, there's a kind of traditional battery for the kind of general car electrics. The motor in this car is actually in the back. Part of the motor seems to be hanging under the boot. So as we've kind of intimated through this video, this tiny car has an absolutely minuscule battery. It's 17.6 kilowatt hours and of that only 16.7 kilowatt hours are actually usable and that gives this car a WLTP range of just 81 miles. That tiny battery size pretty much precludes this car from anything other than city journeys. However, there's another reason why this car won't be taking you from London to Glasgow and actually London to Watford would probably give you the heebie-jeebies. We would like to tell you how fast this car charges on a DC Rapid, but we can't because as you can see it only has a Type 2 port and AC charging. On the plus side, all cars support 22 kilowatt AC charging, which means that if you can find a charger that delivers that kind of level, it'll only take less than an hour to charge the whole battery. And in fact, on, even on a seven kilowatt wall box, it's more like three hours. Smart does talk about an app that allows you to do things like check charge status and schedule charging, but we weren't given access to that for this review. This is a pretty cheap car to run though. It costs just 2.9p per mile with a 14p per kilowatt hour supply. After all the futuristic EVs we've reviewed recently, this car seems rather old-fashioned and traditional in comparison. I'd almost forgot what one of these things looks like. I believe my parents called it a key. Let's see what it does. Basically, you stick it in this slot and then you turn it and if you've got your foot on the brake, there's a beep and the car starts. Amazing! What will they think of next? The steering wheel is pretty standard. You don't get a lot of buttons compared to some cars. This looks like it should be a cruise control, but we had no idea how to get it working. This cycles you up and down a menu, which we'll show you in a second. And this one is for volume and voice control. You get a traditional stalk on the left for lights and indicators. And this is one traditional thing we do appreciate. A physical stalk on the right for the windscreen wipers. You operate drive controls with this thing that looks like a gear stick. You have to press this button on the back and you can choose reverse, neutral, drive. This button here engages eco mode which appears to give you about 10% extra range and makes the acceleration really languid. You might also be wondering what this is. Well my parents used to call it a handbrake. I've not seen one of those in an EV for some years either. You get complete setup discrete controls for the air conditioning but this is quite old-fashioned too. This slider basically you have heat modes and just one cold mode and then you've got these fan buttons and how to direct it. It works reasonably decently and if you actually want to let people into the car there's a button in the central dash for opening the central locking. We rather like this little binnacle thing up here on the right hand side you've got the uh, current charge level uh, and then this gives you kind of power. It never seems to go very far into the regenerative braking section though. And the central display gives you an analog dial showing you speed, um, and you've got a digital one in the middle, but if you press some buttons, which we talked about earlier, you can actually cycle through various menus that many of which don't seem to be particularly useful. Maybe that one's quite useful. But a lot of different kind of trip meters are involved here. Speaking of retro, let's talk about this eight inch LCD panel, which is incredibly bare bones. You get, yep, just an FM radio. There doesn't appear to be DAB, even though it is listed in the specifications. You also get the ability to connect a smartphone just for phone calls. And this absolutely essential feature, which is CarPlay or Android Auto, because yep, this system does not have a built-in sat nav and it's not an option. So I'm going to hook up my phone so we can see how the CarPlay works. So you can see CarPlay has automatically appeared and you get all the functions of my phone here. But these are not coming from the system itself, they're coming from my phone. 
of course you do get quite a decent you can either use Google Maps or um, Apple Maps whichever one you want that one I believe is Google Maps one thing you may have noticed was also missing from that LCD display was any kind of settings for the car all versions of the smart have 80 horsepower which isn't that much but this car only weighs a little bit less than 1100 kilos so actually it still takes 11.6 seconds to get to 62 miles an hour which isn't too bad at all in reality because of the range limitations you're not going to be getting to 62 miles per hour that often in this car it does feel quick though up to 20 or 30 miles per hour which is exactly what you want for nipping around a city the short wheelbase does make the handling pretty precise however speed bumps are quite fun because as you can see there the um, the wheels don't time themselves very well when you go over them so you get a quite a big bump out of a speed bump this is a rear wheel drive car with the motor over the rear wheels so it's great traction light steering and no torque steer it's no speed demon it's nothing like a sport it's a mini electric BMW i3 or even the Honda e, but it's a different kind of car. Much more focused on inner city usage with no pretensions about going further afield at all. Despite the size of this car, it can handle motorway speeds up to 81 miles per hour, but the range drops like a stone when you're doing that kind of speed, allegedly. We wouldn't recommend it at all unless you're already wearing brown trousers. Overall, the Smart EQ for two gets high marks for fun. Not top marks, but definitely high marks. It's one of the best urban driving EVs we've tried. It won't surprise you to learn there's no difference in safety features across all versions of the Smart EQ for two. They all have active brake assistance with forward collision warning, which is a small red triangle on the dashboard. It also has an acoustic presence indicator, so you don't run over guide dogs for the blind. There's also something called crosswind assist, which having seen a few smarts get blown over in storms, we think it's a pretty good idea. Cruise control with speed limiting is available across the range, but not with adaptive abilities, and we couldn't figure out how it worked anyway. There's also the usual electronic stability, ABS and tire monitoring. You get rear parking sensor and cameras on all cars too, but you don't get any of the snazzy newfangled features like lane departure warning or blind spot detection. We got on fine without them though because visibility is excellent all round. The Smart EQ for two is one of the cheapest EVs on the market. The basic premium model is just over £19,000, including the £2,500 government EV grant. The exclusive is a little over £20,000. The Brabus line is around 21 and a half grand and this Blue Dawn edition is 22 and a half thousand. It sounds good value until you realize that the basic Fiat 500 is around the same price and you get quite a bit more range. And two more seats, count them too. For 1,500 pounds more than this car, the Fiat 500 Passion Edition will give you more than twice the range. This car is meant entirely for overcrowded cities and generally feels nicer inside. The warranty is for three years with unlimited miles, which you'd probably be fine hard to do anyway. And there's a 12 year corrosion warranty as well. The battery has an eight year 62,000 mile warranty, although Smart doesn't tell you for what percentage that's for. In some ways, this car isn't good value when you can pick up an MG5 EV for just a few grand more but the Smart EQ for two is much better suited to urban lifestyles and can park in places that other cars cannot reach. On that note, let's try that reversing camera. So put it in reverse, it appears. This is available on all cars. You'll also notice, and I'll just show this, how phenomenal the turning circle is. That's why, for those viewers who like to make comments about how bad my parking is, why I'm doing this is not because I can't park. Not at all. It can literally turn on a sixpence, which for young people is a small coin. This is actually making me a bit dizzy. I'm feeling a bit dizzy now going around like this. So how does the Smart EQ for two compare with the latest EVs? Well, actually, not that bad. It is pretty cheap, but it's not exactly great value considering that small range, which really makes it very much a car just for urban driving. Overall, this is an incredibly fun car for running about town and short commutes. It would definitely have to be your second car, however, unless you never leave the city. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like it, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel.